All right. Thank you so much, everyone, for uh, joining us. Um, I'm Al founder and CEO of Trustology. And today we are going to be talking about what will the future look like. Um, that kind of means that I'm going to be trying to predict stuff that is almost impossible to predict. But we're going to have a little bit of fun of taking what we see today and kind of trying to uh, uh, pro slightly project it into the future and see what it could look like. And then we'll give us a little bit of time to also have a look at uh, any questions that you guys posed, the ask me anything. Uh, very quick um, introduction to Trustology. Uh, it's a custodial wallet uh, service uh, for institutional uh, participants. So um, we custody assets like Bitcoin and Ether and Binance Chain, as well as support DeFi protocols for a range of customers, including institutional investors like uh, DeFi funds and hedge funds, uh, like service providers, um, brokers, exchanges, payment providers, also token issuers and their high net worth individuals. So um, broad spectrum, but very much focused on B2B uh, side of crypto custody and regulated. We are regulated in UK. So I've been asked to have a look and figure out uh, kind of uh, what would um, the future look like. So I'm going to share my screen. Oh, you're going to share a screen now. Okay, I was just going to. Absolutely, you. yeah. Now I will Thank promise. You. And okay, okay. And then I'm going to bring up my wonderful presentation. So hopefully you guys will notice that you're not going to get 50 slides um, because frankly that's quite boring to listen to. So I've tried to be as short as I possibly can be. Um, so. Uh, let's kick off. Uh, so I'll talk about projections. Uh, what, knowing what we know, now know, uh, if we push that forward in time, what could the future look like? And the first ones really, um, kind of, there's a lot of uh, uh, conversation right now around stable coins. So stable coins, of course, are in many different, uh, come in many different flavors. Some come in as uh, stable coins, tokens, typically ERC-20 tokens, but they don't have to be on Ethereum. Um, and they either represent uh, some um, real money, let's call it, pounds, dollars, stored in the bank. And effectively, this is a, a note that represents a claim on that money, and you can move that about. So good examples would be USDT and USDC. And then the other kind of notes that, um, uh, kind of stable coins you get are what's called the uh, kind of uh, synthetic stable coins. So probably the best example of that is MakerDAO. And MakerDAO uh, acts a lot more like a, uh, you know, commercial bank money issuance process. Essentially, people um, create collateral deposits, um, whether it's Ether or uh, another token. And then uh, those deposits uh, then are turned into make it, uh, into DAO coin, uh, DAI coin, and that DAI coin effectively represents credit on the uh, collateralized ether. And then if the price of ether while the varies, then you get margin calls to make sure that the price of DAI is roughly equivalent to one dollar um, by either collateral uh, over collateralizing or under collateralizing as uh, through margin calls the positions. So I think that's been really, really exciting uh, as a kind of uh, uh, as a movement so far. But if you look at how money is made up in the mainstream economy, uh, kind of most of the cash is not actually issued by uh, central banks, um, let's call it the money M1 money supply, but it's issued by um, uh, really commercial banks and the way they do that is by and large through repo or repurchase agreements uh, where effectively you rehypothecate uh, real estate so when you uh, kind of get a mortgage for your house the bank has the right to relend the uh, the title deeds to your house to the central bank and in return they create more notes so essentially the commercial banks create more uh, what's called M2 money, but for most people that's irrelevant. 
it's just more money that they can spend uh, through their debit and credit cards um, because uh, really there is real estate uh, that's been pledged against that money. If all the mortgages on real estate were paid back, then actually the amount of uh, pounds and dollars in the economy would be significantly reduced um, because they represent debt usually in large uh, part against real estate or government bonds. So in principle, if you start to uh, kind of push forward, why not create stable coins that are asset backed by real estate rather than, uh, for instance, something else? Um, and if you say, if you kind of think about it, how would that work? Well, we already now have the explosion in popularity of uh, non-fungible tokens. And non-fungible tokens effectively represent a unique title deed in many cases, whether that title deed happens to be to real estate or a piece of music or a book uh, or a collectible art. Um, it uniquely describes a particular asset. So actually, it's a really good way of representing real estate. And now if you think about real estate and if you can represent the title deeds as an NFT, and you can actually do that relatively easily now legally because you can create a legal company uh, that owns the uh, actual kind of real estate uh, and then the ownership, it can also be uh, the equity uh, or the shares in that company, as long as they're not publicly tradable, uh, can be represented as NFTs. And then the other interesting thing is you can start saying, well, how do you uh, kind of manage the uh, non-fungible token collateralization? You know, if you don't own the entire property, who gets the proceeds, who gets to live in that house? And again, there are already, certainly in Europe, I'm sure there are similar kind of um, agreements in the States, you can create effectively a legal entity uh, that owns the uh, real estate, but in turn, effectively is responsible for leasing that real estate. So if you happen to own the 100% of an NFT, you're essentially charging yourself rent, maybe of zero pounds uh, to live in your house. But as soon as you're not the sole uh, owner of the property, because there might be multiple claimants on the NFT, you can then go ahead and um, charge rent and part of that rent would be then distributed to yourself in which case it's a uh, net zero sum uh, but part of it goes to the uh, kind of whoever else has a pledge against NFT and they get the stream of that revenue and we're now seeing for instance uh, kind of governance rules being managed by other smart contracts uh, DAOs otherwise called to manage both who owns which part of the NFT and how do you make decisions about selling properties and so on. So in the last few years, actually so much of this ecosystem has matured. So you can start to see that it's not beyond the realm of possibility that uh, kind of uh, essentially property will be um, managed as an NFT by a DAO organization uh, and then used as collateral uh, for stable coins. And that's pretty cool because actually it paves the way to create stable coins that have a very tangible correlation to one of the biggest asset classes there is, which is real estate. Um, it does, however, start to potentially impinge a little bit on the commercial model of, uh, sorry, the business model of commercial banks. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more. Then the second one is the central bank digital currencies. You know, there's a lot of hype in this space right now. Um, and you can see the attraction. There are a couple, couple of reasons why, uh, for instance, central banks may be tempted to issue uh, digital currencies. In principle, of course, you know, the, the obvious thing to say is we already have digital currencies. You know, you can swipe your credit card or touch it and uh, there's an electronic payment. But in reality, uh, all of those transactions for normal people, <laughs> retail customers, are managed with the commercial bank money. So this is the money that's been created by banks of typically off the back of the loans of real estate and other loans. So um, now normally that's not an issue, but of course the problem with commercial bank money is that there is risk on the commercial bank because if you keep your money with a commercial bank and it goes bust, then certainly in UK you get your first 85,000 pounds back because of the government backed insurance. 
But beyond that, you'll lose your money. So maybe less relevant on smaller transactions, but becomes very relevant on larger transactions. And of course, because most of the payments nowadays are done by commercial banks, we saw in 2007, the uh, governments could not stop their support for um, commercial banks because the entire payment infrastructure would be destroyed. The too big to uh, fail kind of syndrome. Whilst of course, uh, what we're now seeing is blockchain paves the way for uh, kind of potentially at least having the technology for central banks to directly issue central bank money, the equivalent of paper, uh, to uh, kind of their citizens bypassing the commercial bank risk if they choose to do that. Now, there are many, many issues with doing that because so much of our current infrastructure is predicated on this model, but at least now there is a way a transition path that central banks can take if they wanted to do that. They also might be tempted to inflate the M1 supply um, by printing money directly without through use of commercial banks as quantity of easing um, stops being effective. You know, huge amounts of money being printed recently, uh, which actually have been largely uh, kind of making people think about moving to cryptocurrencies, with, which can't be inflated by a central bank. But even central banks might look at the current model and say, you know what, uh, we might want to take uh, senior age revenues. And this is basically kind of if creating money out of thin air as an alternative to quantitative easing uh, to earth the be uh, burden of debt, for instance. Um, so it's interesting that stable coins might end up squeezing the commercial banks on the M2 supply, whilst the central banks may start, uh, start to squeeze uh, commercial banks by expanding the M1 money supply. Let's kind of keep going. And the next thing that worth probably thinking about is GovID. So what I mean by that? Today, governments obviously issue passports, they issue driving licenses. They're, they're already in the identity game. Uh, but so far, they've kept out of the uh, kind of online identity game. There are some exceptions. Estonia has digital uh, kind of identity that they issue, and it's been extremely successful and popular there. Um, and as we recognize that more and more of our business is done online, at that point, it may be a natural step for governments to start uh, being the uh, guardian of digital identity. Um, and then, of course, cryptographic signatures, I think, will become the norm, whether it's centralized or decentralized. The level of assurity that you get through cryptographic signatures is simply superior to the uh, kind of existing solutions. So much of what we do today with document signatures like DocuSign and a lot of the uh, kind of online transactions. There's a huge amount of fraud because we don't have cryptographic, uh, cryptographic signatures. Um, and all of those particular problems can be reduced by moving towards cryptography, private public keys linked to your digital identity. Um, UK has already got this concept of GovID or government ID uh, for government services, where the government licenses uh, identity providers to effectively onboard customers and issue them government ID which can be used across the range of services. And I suspect um, kind of uh, this will permeate across the world as, as digital lives become ever more important or as important as your physical lives. Next up is uh, government AML. So I think this is possibly a stretch, uh, but it's worth exploring. So, you know, obviously we've all heard, especially with COVID, uh, governments want to move away from uh, kind of cash society. This is banknotes and uh, you know metal money. Uh, it spreads disease. It's actually quite expensive to uh, kind of handle. It's interesting, you know. Uh, we had the news that Tesla um, doesn't want to use Bitcoin anymore because of environmental impact. One thing that isn't mentioned is the environmental impact of printing uh, money and then transporting it in big trucks between shops and banks. It actually has quite a high carbon footprint as well. Um, but of course, the other nice advantage of potentially the government's directly injecting themselves in the flow of transactions is they can collect taxes more efficiently and also potentially reduce the cost of money laundering. 
Because one thing they do right now is that they outsource money laundering to the payment service providers, the banks, and so on, which means that typically every transaction is checked potentially by six or seven different banks. That costs money. And what that does is then actually at the lower end of people who don't have large bank deposits end up being underbanked or unbanked completely, creating a really expensive uh, kind of black uh, economy for them because they can't have direct access to banking services. Um, so it's bad news for those individuals and actually bad news for the government because um, they then cannot uh, reduce the black economy size, nor can they go cashless. Uh, whilst if we inject AML into the flow uh, of the tokens themselves and let the government monitor uh, the transactions and decide if uh, certain transactions need to be uh, quarantined, that potentially reduces the cost of money laundering and expands uh, the use of uh, electronic banking to a wider audience. There may be kind of concerns around privacy or the governments may not want to be on the hook for this, um, but I suspect some jurisdictions will move to this. And then if the cost basis for GovAML is sufficiently interesting, then I suspect it will spread around the world. Um, moving on then. Uh, now, the term I've just made up is ISEX. So these are non-fiat, not pounds and dollars, international settlement currencies. Um, and that's really kind of uh, the idea that, well, basically take Bitcoin. It's probably the best example of an ISEC right now. Um, you know, we are seeing large parts of the world uh, effectively looking to de-dollarize themselves, especially for international trade. And they will have a whole host of different reasons for doing so. In some countries, uh, like you know Russia and China, it's because uh, kind of they don't particularly like the sanctions imposed by them, largely by US and EU. Um, so, you know, doing international trades in um, EU euros or dollars is becoming increasingly risky for them. So they're looking to create um, new channels, you know, whether you use uh, digital yen or the rubles, um, they certainly don't want to be using SWIFT anymore. Um, so we're seeing, you know, large parts of the world with huge number of people looking to move away from an international currency. But the question is, where do you move to? Do you just swap one dominant currency for another? And maybe, maybe the world this time around say, well, we don't need to choose who we want to subjugate ourselves to. We'll go for a non-government issued uh, kind of Bitcoin-like solution where no single entity can inflate the supply of it or quarantine another nation. And whilst this may not be as relevant at a national level where we're all subject to laws and regulations, of that particular jurisdiction in international waters, that might be the Gordian uh, kind of not a solution to the problem of uh, kind of uh, who do you choose to be subjugated to financially. So an interesting angle there. But again, if you now get ISEX becoming the natural solution, it starts to impede on the business model of large commercial banks that act as a correspondent banking solution for international transfers. And then we move on to the next phase, which is decentralized finance. Now, right now it's still infinite, infinitely smaller than the centralized finance in terms of depth and liquidity. But we're seeing massive acceleration. If you look at the amount of funds being exchanged on decentralized exchanges, um, as well as increasing depth of liquidity for uh, kind of lending and borrowing pools as well as derivatives, we can see pretty enormous acceleration in very short period of time. And the other interesting thing is if you start working with these solutions, you'll find that the friction to use them quickly without massive onboarding issues is, is very low. Uh, you know, if you got a um, wallet that supports DeFi transactions, you've essentially got now uh, universal access to thousands of decentralized finance services on, on Ethereum uh, without having to onboard an individual service. And you can plug and play them to create perfect customized solutions or mass customized solutions to your particular needs. 
And given the fact that we see that systems that are simpler uh, have less friction and less fraud because of cryptography in this case, tend to win over uh, systems that are pretty complex to onboard to. Uh, and right now, DeFi is still in infancy. It's still something that only people who understand this space can do that. But the amount of user experience improvement we've seen even in the last few years is pretty enormous. And we're seeing bifurcation of DeFi protocols for professionals and then simpler skins over that uh, for more retail users, but all using the DeFi principles uh, and the kind of the power of the DeFi with a uh, kind of skin, uh, much simpler skins um provided by various portfolio tracking solutions and so on so really exciting space the other thing that is interesting about DeFi, of course is that um it's very very international if you look at much of the liquidity pools they tend to be regional um because kind of it's sometimes very hard to trust a system that uh as a foreigner you may may not want to have access to DeFi is international in its nature. Um, you know, if you look at the concentration of IP addresses for different protocols, they tend to be truly global, unlike the more regional uh, kind of um, utilization, even in, in the uh, kind of crypto C5. You know, Binance is considered a lot more closely associated with Asia, uh, Coinbase US, and so on. So those centralized exchanges tend to be still regional um ish uh, kind of certainly traditional exchanges a lot more regional DeFi effectively gives you a global platform for liquidity and relatively passive returns through uh kind of staking so if you kind of project that forward it's not unreasonable to expect that the DeFi depth of liquidity whether it's for lending borrowing or trading is going to be superior to the C5. And therefore, then it will have this gravitational effect where uh, kind of deeper liquidity attracts further liquidity at the point where liquidity out of centralized exchanges and lending pools gets sucked out into the DeFi. May may not happen, uh, but it's, uh, it's something that's not beyond the realm of possibility. And in which case, then, let's have a look. Uh, what's the impact? And the impact is actually pretty severe because whether we realize this or not, a lot of our um, uh, kind of today's world is based on um, the dominance of commercial banks in the way that we transact. Uh, but the combination of all those things, the stable coins, uh, effectively uh, taking away some of the M2 supply generation and the revenues that the commercial banks take from those the cbdc is expanding the money m1 money supply and potentially constricting the m2 supply as a result of that um some of the revenues that if you combine gov id and gov aml right now uh with blockchain it becomes possible to not have to have a bank for digital transactions because between the gov id the gov aml and stable coins and, and CBDCs, you now have uh, equivalence in terms of control uh, without the need to uh, kind of accept the commercial bank risk, uh, which is the current business model. Uh, and that's the trade off we made as a society so far. And then, of course, all those huge international trade uh, flows and the revenues that commercial banks generate through. Uh, kind of the uh, correspondent banking fees potentially may uh, get impacted um, if international settlement currencies start to dominate. And last but not least, what do commercial banks do? They kind of take your money in deposit, they help you to do uh, make payments and so on, but importantly, they earn revenue by lending it out. Well, now we have a much more direct market where folks can go uh, supply liquidity to lending pool, other folks borrow, and it's relatively simple and passive. Um, therefore, again, it removes one of the revenue streams that commercial banks have. So very hard to predict what will happen. There's so many variables, but I think one of the big things that's really needs to be kind of, I think most people need to understand is that commercial banks, at least as they are right now, may not be around if they don't adapt themselves um, 
in the relatively near future, and we're talking about you know probably 10 to 15 year horizon um, rather than five, uh, but nonetheless, I think there are some really systemic changes coming on board that may look small right now, uh, but like an avalanche, you know, they kind of combine together and then people go, what the hell just happened? In reality, that's been happening for a long time, but once you have this confluence of uh, multiple uh, drivers amplifying uh, and creating an amplitude high enough to avalanche uh, a seismic shift, it becomes uh, it becomes almost unstoppable. Uh, but none of that will compare with more future uh, disruptions, and that really is probably going to be robotics, AI, and space. Now, it sounds funny to talk about that, but if you think about it, right now, you know, value is relative. Uh, money is all about relative value, one thing versus the other, and being able to have promises in, forms, in form of money, which you can claim later for food. Work now, eat later. Well, that's all premised on scarcity, scarcity of human minds, scarcity of uh, kind of human muscle, and scarcity of uh, raw materials. But actually, as robotic comes, uh, robotic comes on, uh, on board, maybe we don't need muscle anymore. As AI comes on board, we don't need brains as much anymore. They become less valuable. And then, of course, if we start to expand into space, uh, then raw materials might become plentiful. Um, uh, kind of maybe not space on the planet, but certainly raw materials that we can bring back to Earth. And that is going to have a massive disruption on what we value at what stage. Um, so pretty big topic, and uh, no one knows what that would look like, uh, but something interesting to explore. And I will stop sharing, and I'll find out if anyone's got any questions. We've got a few minutes there. Cool. Anyone, any questions? And can someone just chat me in case uh, they listen and not heard? Maybe I've been speaking to myself all this time. Awesome, Richard. Thank you so much. And uh, Alexi, <laughs> yeah, I'm hoping getting your name right. How long uh, do you believe some of these transitions will take? Um, I would say we we're, we're probably not going to see uh, obvious changes within uh, beyond the enthusiast space. You know, day to day, I don't think you're going to be impacted for the next three to five years. I think the five to ten years, um, I suspect you will see a much more uh, kind of stable coin that's uh, real estate backed. I think that's a, you know, there's a clear legal path to that and there's an obvious advantage to that as well. Um, Jury's out on the central bank deposit uh, deposits and jury's out, uh, sorry, it's central bank digital currencies, but I think it will happen. Um, it will start as a competition between uh, different currencies and more centrally controlled economies. It makes a lot of sense to issue that there isn't the commercial banking infrastructure that uh, kind of uh, fights that uh, or, or will be displaced. Uh, and then a more efficient tax collection, AML and compliance will bring the cost of transactions down as a result. And I think then others will have to follow. So five to 10 year horizon. And then international settlement, um, kind of it's probably 10 to 15 years. Great. And thank you for that um, question. Richard, do you think the commercial banks will control uh, the evolution more and more as they rise in the building their own blockchain and big data AI offerings. They, Richard, they absolutely have the opportunity to lead the discussion. You know, right now, uh, those, you know, trust is a extremely sticky business, and whether or not we like banks or not, and people diff have different opinions. 
uh, still people implicitly in by and large trust them. So uh, they, they have all the uh, relationships today to build on. Um, uh, but that's uh, that that is not an infinite pool. So if if kind of we seeing, for instance, technology companies, more and more people trust technology companies to do tech focused things. So uh, it might be that the commercial transaction space transitions uh, from dominance by banks to dominance by large trusted uh, technology companies. Cool, but certainly the banks have a lot of the resource uh, if they choose to deploy it in the right way in the next foreseeable, uh, foreseeable future. And Robin, thank you so much for that link there. I would agree. And it's a great article from Bank of England on public versus private money. Um, took me a while. There's, uh, uh, I think that the social life of money is a great book to read as well. It really debunks a lot of the things uh, that um, you may, may not know about uh, kind of uh, money. So um, on that note, I am out of time. Really appreciate everyone joining in. And I hope uh, kind of you, you have the rest of the sessions. Um, enjoy those too. Thank you so much.